Coming up on DTNS, Google helps you avoid wildfires. Will Microsoft Flight Simulator make computer hardware soar? And how can we all be fans together while apart? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, August 21st, 2020 in lovely Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Rich Straffolino. And from Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chain. And if you want to get the wider conversation on our expanded show with the Ohio contingent in full effect, get a good day. You can get Good Day Internet by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. But first, let's get started with a few tech things you should know. <laughs> The Israeli newspaper Calculist reports that, according to sources, Apple acquired the augmented reality startup Camera AI sometime between 2018 and 2019. The company's employees were reportedly integrated into Apple's computer vision team, with the company's tech already integrated into Apple's product line as of 2020. Before the reported acquisition, Camera AI sold an SDK and a set of AR tools that offered the ability to outline objects and apply filters to them in an image, as well as their own software-based background blurring portrait mode. LG announced it will bring transparent OLED displays to subways in Beijing and Shenzhen. The 55-inch panels will display real-time info about subway schedules, locations, and transfers on train windows, starting on Line 6 in Beijing and Line 10 in Shenzhen. The company plans to extend the tech to other subway lines over time. They just need to put the LCARS interface on that, and it'll be really awesome. In a regulatory filing, Amazon announced that Jeff Wilkie, CEO of its worldwide consumer business, will retire next year. Current Senior Vice President of Retail Operations Dave Clark will succeed him in the role. Wilkie initially joined Amazon in 1999 and is part of Amazon's S team of senior executives that report directly to Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos. Facebook updated a support page to advise that the classic Facebook UI experience featuring the blue navigation bar at the top will no longer be available starting in September. Facebook began rolling out its platform redesign on mobile last year and introduced a wider opt-in web design in March. And TikTok senior executive Vanessa Pappas told Bloomberg that TikTok will continue to operate in the U.S., saying we have multiple paths forward. Pappas said TikTok has not been presented with evidence regarding the national security concerns cited in the executive order that will ban transactions with the company, and that so far the company has not seen an exodus of employees. All right, so let's get further into our discussion, Rob. I cannot wait. Uh, first up here, Google announced uh, updates to provide users with more information about ongoing wildfires. When searching for a wildfire in search, Google will now show a map featuring near real-time uh, boundary lines of the fire. This feature will initially was already initially rolled out as a pilot in California last year and is now rolling out across the U.S., Google Maps will also update with road closures impacted by the wildfires and route around roadblocks, as well as providing alert notifications if viewing an area near a wildfire. Google developed the mapping features with input from Cal the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services and uses data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's GOES satellites, which is then processed through Google's geospatial analysis platform, Earth Engine, with maps updated hourly. Obviously, this is something, you know, uh, kind of critically needed uh the most up-to-date information that you can get uh, especially now at this time uh with with everything that's going on particularly in california but it's interesting rob uh you know seeing this rolling out across the u.s i'm sure this is useful for you know people that are uh, obviously concerned about what's going on in california but definitely could see some applications if google can kind of integrate this uh with other uh data sets and other services uh over time you know kind of worldwide yeah, so th this is one of the things. I'm I'm actually glad that they're taking this uh, step. Now, you're always going to have the you know the privacy concerns of you know um, you know you are kind of the product when it comes to uh, you know to Google. But this is one where they really are. You know, th this is going to help people. You know, so you can look at your phone. And you can kind of see. I probably should not hike up this hill this day. Uh, that that is a good thing. So uh, you know, I'm you know I'm looking forward to these type of. Uh, you know, uses of, of of big data from a company like Google. Yeah, and we're we're seeing them uh, being very aggressive with rolling out updates to maps. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, Waze, which is a Google-owned property, being kind of aggressive with expanding the like more contextual information, providing more topographical information, which seemingly is kind of I, I think now that everyone has kind of figured out turn by turn, or at least the big kind of two competitors in the map space kind of have. Uh, that like locked down as a consumer product, that these kind of services are really the value add. Um, it, like if you want to look at it in a very cynical way, uh, outside of being you know potentially life saving uh, for people as well. 
Yeah, and like I said, I was a huge fan of Waves when they uh, started running around trains because um, it can, you know, it can save you 10, 15 minutes. You know, if you get stuck behind a train, especially when you're in an area that you know, you kind of ignore when it reroutes you. But you know, if you understand why they're doing it, um, as they're doing with trains, you kind of might take their advice. Yeah, and the the thing I'll be interested to see is if they can, uh, yeah, you know, like I said, they've been they've been working with government agencies and kind of open data sets. If they can expose some APIs so that other agencies and other you know big um, uh, meteorological data sets can work this in, you know, potentially expand this into stuff uh, like the paths of hurricanes. Uh, I, I know there's all sorts of alerting systems already in place with that, but it would be interesting if you could have that directly associated with maps, uh, you know, putting things like hurricanes, maybe even flash flood warnings and stuff like that uh, to just really uh, make that as useful as possible for people going forward. Right. So Facebook told The Verge's Casey Newton that it's piloting new content moderation policy based off a recent report from the Center of American Progress. The report titled Fighting Coronavirus Misinformation and Disinformation suggested that social media platforms suspend algorithmic amplification and prioritize rapid review and fact checking of trending coronavirus content that displays reliable information markers, create a privacy focused system that scans draft posts discussing COVID-19 and suggest quality information as well as embed. And this is the key here. They're going to actually embed quality information and relevant fact checks around coronavirus related posts. So, yeah, this one is uh, one that uh, I kind of like it because there's a ton of uh, misinformation out there. But the folks, that, particularly the ones that are spreading the misinformation, are not going to like this. Uh, you know, how dare you correct me in real time as I try <laughs> to tell the world about, you know, masks being safe or not being safe. So um, this is, uh, you know, something that I think that, uh, you know, a company like, you know, Facebook and other social media platforms, uh, they need to do. They probably should have been doing this, uh, you know, for years at this point. But I, I'm at least uh, glad to see that they're going to be able to curb some of the crazy theories that are being put out there about this pandemic. Well, and I, I want to break it down really quick amongst those three kind of major points here. And let's start. I, I think the last one, I think, is potentially the least uh, uh, uh uh, the one that seems like they're already kind of doing in a lot of ways, they're already a lot of social media platforms, you know, this isn't just a Facebook specific thing. A lot of social media platforms are already kind of putting contextual information around posts that are talking that are talking about claims uh, related to COVID-19. Um, and so, you know, kind of expanding that, that's that seems like something that the social networks have kind of agreed or, or, or there is some consensus around, okay, this is something that we can do that is a benefit to our users and, you know, could potentially help stop the spread of misinformation. It's the other two that I think get very interesting. The, the algorithmic amplification and kind of using that as a trigger to look at, okay, something is getting extremely popular on our platform. It's probably a good idea if we get some eyes on that going forward. Now, uh, we don't know exactly, specifically in the context of Facebook, what their pilot looks like on this. Um, but, you know, I would be surprised if that's not already a triggering effect. But, uh, you know, Rob, from your perspective, I guess, how important would that be to kind of, OK, this is getting so many clicks or so many likes or so many engagements per hour. Let's uh, let's have some eyes on that. I mean, does that seem like something you said it should have already been done, right? Yeah, they, they should have been doing this. And, and this is something that's important because it is amazingly fast how stuff can spread on Facebook. I mean, you literally can have something go viral and a million people see it within an hour. Mm -hmm. um, this, the, you know, the, the ability for something like that to happen just didn't exist. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, um, you know, you go back to when we were kids, it's like, you know, if something was on the nightly news that was highly produced, you know, it could, you know, it could get around the world, uh, you know, pretty quickly. But literally someone can put a post on Facebook and someone in Australia can know about it within seconds. It's uh, so the fact that if, if something is going viral, uh, let's get some humans looking at this and make sure it's legit. I don't really have a problem with that. And like I said, I think that this is something they should have been doing for, for some time now. Well, and that last one uh, about, you know, kind of reading draft posts and being, you know, and providing some information around that, you know, to your point, I don't, I don't know how much that changes someone's behavior that's intent on doing that. But Facebook is already kind of doing something like that on Instagram, where if you are about to post some a comment on a post or something like that, that uh, you know, has certain language triggers and stuff like that. It will ask the user, are you sure you want to post that? You know, this may go against Facebook's community guidelines. And I haven't seen like a huge now. Now, the content that goes on Instagram is very different than the content that necessarily goes on Facebook kind of by design. Um, so that you may be speaking to, to different audiences, even if that is the same company. Um, 
I, I think that will be the one that, uh, you know, I would be interested to see if the Facebook pilot actually includes that as a policy and the effectiveness of it. People aren't going to like that. <laughs> How dare you correct me as I post this misinformation? Because you think it's real. Uh, probably, you know, a lot of people that are posting stuff they think is real. So they don't want to be corrected as they're actually typing it out. But, uh, you know, th these are, and, and from where I'm sitting, these are welcome enhancements to the platform. Well, and it will uh, it'll be interesting to see next time Pew comes out with their new study. We talked about yesterday on the show about uh, looking at the idea of political censorship on the platform. If these policies go into effect, uh, what effect that would have on that discussion. Uh, next up here, you know, it wasn't too long ago that the big question when it came to games was, can it run Crisis? And those days may be behind us, but the newly released Microsoft Flight Simulator might be the app that spurs a lot of hardware upgrades, kind of to the same effect. That's according to a new report from John PD Research, which estimates that the simulator will generate $2.6 billion in PC hardware sales based on an estimated 2.27 million copies sold. How do you average $1,100 in hardware sales per copy sold? Well, part of it comes to the hardware needed to run the sim, which is, is pretty extensive with the recommended uh, specs to run the game, 150 gigabyte SSD, uh, GeForce RTX 2080 or AMD Radeon uh, 7 GPUs, and a high-end eight-core CPU from either of the big vendors. But there's also extensive peripheral market for flight sticks, throttles, rubber pedals. I know Airbus came out with an official throttle that they're kind of packaging together with the game that's you know authentic to, a, to an Airbus. Uh, uh, playing and stuff like that, and it, it you know it adds that that realism and kind of that culture of flight simulators that's been going on for decades now. According to Falcon Northwest owner Kelt Reeves, it's the most taxing game we've seen in its generation of hardware since Crisis. So, Rob, my first question is: Are you a flight sim uh, uh, person? And do, do these numbers make sense? That's a lot of money to to kind of spur with hardware upgrades for for a game. So I am not a flight sim person from the standpoint that I would be willing to go spend $1,100 to upgrade my <laughs> hardware to play the flight sim game. I might be interested in it to just, you know, if it's going to run on what I have, but I don't know that I'm willing to upgrade to that extent for one game. Um, so you know, I've thought about this even since we talked about it, you know, in our pre-show, it's like, you know, are, are you going to get that many people that are going to really spend that amount of money um, on an upgrading this? And it's like, yeah, it, 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 it's possible. But, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, a lot of people have been waiting for this for a long time. So for, you know, when you start adding in, as you said, the joysticks, the rudder pedals, new chairs, uh, well, you know, I got a new sim game, got to get a new headset um, so I can hear people better. You know, th those kind of things, they tend to add up. So, you know, I could see it getting to that 1100. But, you know, like the, the non-flight simulator guy in me says that's that's a lot of money. I, I will I will say from my experience, just knowing one person who was super into flight sims in college, it's I like to call it like a 21st century model train mindset. Like people who have model trains, over time their setup gets bigger as they build more elaborate uh, track systems, get different trains. They go very meticulous with the livery. They want to make sure it's accurate. And so for a lot of the flight sim guys, it or gals too, uh, isn't. You know, when you play, it's more about like, I'm going to fly this plane that I will never be able to fly in real life. I get to fly a 747. I get to fly a Concorde. I get to fly because you can you can purchase add on packs that add uh, new plane models that are more than just the models or the flight dynamics as well. Uh, and there's a huge community like so much. So there's a magazine that's kind of catered toward them called the PC Flight Sim. Uh, and it's. You know, I mean, it's only if you assume 2.27 million copies sold globally, I, it, it it does make sense. It's not like everyone in the you know there's 2.27 million people in the U.S. that's gonna splurge 1,100 bucks on this on these upgrades. And the last thing I will say is, if you spec out a new PC, which if you bought the game the last time the game came out, right, the, like the official release, I know there's been add-on packs, was 2012. Let's say you built a PC 2012, 2013 to play that. Odds are you're due for a new PC anyway, and you know if you spec out something with the you know a Core i7 9800 and an RTX 2080, that's probably going to run you above that $1,100 cost anyway. So I imagine that's also rolled into there as well. Yeah, that, that's a good point because I didn't think about how long it's been since the last time the game came out, and you know so we're, we're talking about eight, nine, ten, eleven, you know uh, year old hardware where this game was running before. So in you know in preparation for this, if you need to get new hardware. It's probably going to cost you significantly more than eleven hundred bucks. So, you know, could you get to that number? 
Yeah, uh, but I, but once again, I won't be shocked if, if that's not the number that we get to a new hardware <laughs> for this one thing. That that is a you know when you billion that's a, that's a big number, two point seven on that. So it's 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 it could get there, but I just don't know that it will. So a new research effort from Fabian Mincer and a team of Google Research published details on image compression methodology called High Fidelity Generative Image Compression, or HIFI-C for short. This is a lossy compression technique um, like the current JPEG standard, but uses a generative adversarial neural network um, with learned compression to rebuild data lost to compression when viewing the image, the resulting image in higher quality images and at smaller file sizes. The authors of the paper acknowledge that the technique in theory can produce images um, that are very different from the input. However, while currently still in the research phase, the paper shows that HIFI-C can achieve quality similar to the approaches uh, of, um, or excuse me, similar to the approaches that actually have two times the bit rate. So um, they can really crunch images really, really small with this technology. Um, so it will be impressive if they can actually pull this off, but, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure that, you know, if you're you know, doing this on an image, you know, you know, of a, you know, of your kids, that their nose is still in the right place. They still have two ears <laughs> because, um, you know, it's, it, it's, th this is interesting. I, you know, I'm, I'm for multiple reasons. I'm interested in this technology. As I was saying, you know, before my, my father's a, you know, he is a retired photographer. And, you know, one, you know, and I can see where this technology could go, not just for compressing images, but actually also helping you restore other images that are also, uh, you know, there. Whereas if you could take an image that's somewhat distorted or, you know, it's just an old Polaroid from the 50s or 60s, and you can use this type of technology to make best guesses of what this color would have been or what this pixel should have looked like. Um, you know, that is something that, uh, you know, a lot of photographers and a lot of people who do uh, photography editing uh, would welcome. Yeah, and we've seen this on the other end with photography, where we've we've started to see these neural networks uh, do upscaling, right? Where you have a very low res image, you want to print it at a bigger size, or maybe you want to see if you can enhance some detail. You know, the 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 mythical zoom in enhance, right? Um, and it, it's it's certainly not at a at a comical CSI level or anything like that. But there are algorithms that can effectively using a, a network that knows how images are compressed and how are shrunken down can then kind of reverse that process and you know estimate what an image would look like when it's blown up. Interesting to see that in reverse. Uh, so uh, you know, still in the scientific stages, JPEG is a is a very sticky standard, right? It's it's you know, uh, Apple is trying to kind of do their own compression stuff. So even if this is effective, I will be curious to see you know what kind of adoption it gets, especially if there's any weird licensing or anything that goes along with it as well. There's all sorts yeah. of politics when it comes to standards. The thing with JPEG is that it it works. <laughs> it, it it works really really well. So you can't just do a little bit better than what mm -hmm. JPEG can already do to get people to change. You're going to have to actually truly really make these images a head of a lot smaller so that they can see the value in, in using a different technology. Yeah, and then another cool uh, research news, uh, Facebook announced its research team hit a new milestone in embodied AI that might allow for virtual assistants or robots to interact with physical space more similarly to humans. Using a new open source tool called, called SoundSpaces, developers can train virtual AI systems in 3D environments representing indoor spaces using highly realistic acoustics that can simulate sound sources. This will allow for AIs to identify different sounds, but also determine where it's coming from, using it as a data point to help navigate a space. So you can kind of train this all automatically and then kind of deploy it in a real space. This is then combined with another quote called semantic map net that lets AI's systems map unknown spaces with sound and remember the locations and context of items in that space, resulting in a 30% better map accuracy using similar amounts of movements and comparable to traditional room mapping. Both tools are available on Facebook's AI Habitat uh, simulation platform, so you can go ahead and kind of try that out. I think the hope, obviously, they hope that uh, you give it a try and, and start embedding that into your systems. And... You know, again, something that's still in the scientific stage, using sound is nothing new to kind of determine space. It was used in cameras in the 70s for autofocus. It's used in cars to, to back up. But, you know, uh, smarter AI, smarter virtual or, or robot assistants, that sounds kind of cool to me. Right, Rob? Yeah, this, you know, in, anything that's going to make these things more accurate. Um, you know, I'm all for it. And, you know, from, from what I'm reading and a little bit of research that I've done, this is not terribly expensive. Uh, you know, so, you know, when you start, you know, strapping cameras everywhere on stuff, 
uh, that that has a cost to it. Uh, this is using sound that you can point, you know, directionally, um, and uh, you know, and microphones, to, you know, to listen to it. So it's uh, it's going to be interesting just to see, you know, where this technology goes. And I'm just wondering, like, what iteration of the Matrix are we in with all of this AI? <laughs> <laughs> All I know is I, I want like the first robot that has this deployed just to be named Daredevil or something like that, because I think that that would just be uh, maybe too cute by half, but I would approve of it and chuckle at the same time. Uh, but remember, though, uh, to get all of your tech headlines each day in about five minutes, you can subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. <laughs> All right, getting into our main discussion here. You know, since COVID-19 lockdown started to take effect earlier this year, we've seen the necessity of social distancing causing us all trying to figure out how to remotely engage in one's routine activities, right? I mean, we've had things like uh, this. This kind of all started it kind of, I guess, based on my recollection of it, at least, is around the necessities, right? Kind of figuring out how you get to work and school remotely. That was kind of dominating uh, a lot of the news in, in March, at least in the U.S. here. And then as lockdowns have stayed in place, we've gradually shifted to things like remote events. You know, how do we still all kind of get together for, for a shared uh, event? In the U.S., we're now starting to see this play out in the sports world as well. Uh, Taylor Soper over at GeekWire wrote up his experiences about re what remote NBA fandom looks like in the age of social distancing. This involved using the new Microsoft teams together mode that places participants in a video call against a shared virtual background and then allowing that person to see themselves with a big group of people and also having that broadcast uh, in the in the arena itself. Overall, he found that the setup uh, to be daunting for an everyday fan to kind of get initially started, but that the actual experience was solid and fun. Um, you know, Rob, you know, from that fandom perspective, it's it is something that is is tough to replicate virtually. We've seen we've seen other sports leagues kind of put the tokens in of okay, we're gonna have we're gonna have virtual fandom in that we're gonna have paper cutouts of people sitting in the stands. You know, the NBA is usually pretty uh, uh, pretty out front when it comes to technology. Um, from what you've seen of of this kind of experience, you know, does that fill the start filling the gap of of what's been missing from the fan experience? Uh, the NBA and Microsoft are absolutely winning with what they're doing in the bubble with the, you know, the giant video screens um, behind the sidelines to where, you know, you know, as the camera goes to that low angle, you literally are looking at basketball, you know, human basketball players and you're looking at video representation of fans simultaneously. And, you know, they they talked about it, you know, ad nauseum, you know, when the bubble first started. But now, you know, they'll make a mention, you know, here and there. They will actually, you know, if there's a, you know, a, you know, a, a famous fan who's watching, they'll do a shout out and actually go to their, uh, you know, particular feed. But I don't notice that these basketball games are not being played in arenas, but are being played in a ballroom, um, you know, f from that aspect, from the fan aspect. It's pretty cool. You know, if you can't go see the game with your friends, if you can actually sit in front of your computer um, with your camera on and watch the game and see some of your friends who are enjoying the game at the same time, when, you know, when you know, there's a great play, you guys are all cheering, you can actually see that. That's cool technology um, to me. And I think that we are really just on the cusp of what we're going to see. You know, this pandemic, you know, unfortunately has changed the world forever. So we're going to see a lot of things that are, are socially distanced. And, uh, you know, what the NBA is doing here, what, you know, Microsoft's doing with them, um, I think is, is really, really impressive. Yeah. And I mean, the next step to this is like the, the NBA is doing this in a very tested, very secure environment, right? They're, they're, it's limited to like 300 fans per game. It's all heavily moderated. You, know, you can't put signs in front of your faces. They'll kick you out if you're being a, you know, if you're not being a good fan and stuff like that, which is actually a significant departure from the usual fan experiences in some stadiums. So, I mean, that's like, I, I wonder how that can expand. The other question that I have for, for the NBA specifically is, okay, now I want to, I want to also have this experience and maybe have like, be able to invite, you know, a select group of people, I think is the next logical step. Obviously they're still just trying to make sure this all works and this, this can all scale. But then there are, there are a whole other industries, you know, once sports figure this out, sports has a lot of money. They're comfortable using technology. They're already set up for broadcast. That's one level of, of, you know, they have a business interest in serving those fans. 
but there's there's tons of other industries, and you brought up a really good example, you know, kind of in the comedy space of uh, what performers like Kev on stage has been doing. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and what he's been doing with that? So yeah, so Kev on stage is a uh, you know is a you know comedian. He's actually in a couple of uh, commercials that are out right now that you might recognize. But uh, you know he's a you know a, you know a decently mid range comedian as far as just his stature, but. He was just saying, you know, with this pandemic, I, I need to perform. I need to get in front of people, but I can't get in front of people. What can I do? So for himself and for his friends who are also comedians, we're going to just live stream our live shows, which when you think about comedy, that's not something that's done. It's like, you know, if you ever go to a comedy show that, you know, oftentimes they make you actually uh, not just turn your cell phone off. You have to put your cell phone in a bag and they keep it until you leave. Um, whereas what, you know, what, you know, Kevin on stage is doing with his, uh, socially distanced comedy tours that no, we're, we're going to record this live and then broadcast it out. And, you know, I was listening to his podcast and he was talking about, you know, some of the comments that he's gotten. And one of the ones that really stood out to me was that it was a military family where, you know, a wife wrote in and said that her husband is currently stationed in Afghanistan, but his live comedy show allowed them to have a date night, even though he's on the other side of the world. So, you know, they actually watch this live show together while texting and FaceTiming each other. And even though they are separated by oceans, um, they were kind of able to have that joint experience of watching the same thing live in real time. And I think that that's just the start of how people are going to start using these type of technologies, whether it be on Zoom or whether it be, uh, you know, like we're doing this, you know, via Skype, you know, you know, regardless of the technology, you're going to see people figure out ways how to use it and to get that closeness that they're lacking, um, you know, right now in this pandemic. Yeah, and it's it's interesting to see kind of the the top down you know, NBA and Microsoft signed signature agreement to use Microsoft Teams to virtually put fans in seats. And then, you know, and, and then the opposite of that is, is you know, performers that are, you, we're seeing this across comedy with the virtual comedy clubs and, and you know, uh, instead of selling tickets to shows, you're selling tickets to their, you know, performances of their podcast or something like that uh, as a way to kind of keep going. And that and that all seems very or, uh, organic, maybe is the wrong word, but bottom up, you know, they're, they're using whatever mm-hmm. tools are out there whether they were ever designed for that or not, and if it suits their needs and it can and help connect their fans to them and and allow the fans, I think, also to get some kind of interaction, which is key, and get that feedback from fans, especially for an area like comedy where it's like, you need to know if something is, you, you can write something, I think it's hilarious, and if, if it doesn't land with fans, you know, what what good does that do you? So uh, super interesting to see how that will develop, uh, and I'm sure someone will find out how to make uh, some money on the side with that as well. Absolutely, <laughs> of course. absolutely. And remember, though, uh, you can join in our conversation on Discord, uh, which you can join by linking uh, to our Patreon or linking your Patreon account uh, at patreon.com slash DTNS. Uh, We love seeing all of our patrons there. Always good stuff. But now, Rob, let's check out the mailbag. So in today's mailbag, we've got Mike in steamy Dubai, who actually wrote us a letter. And it goes, uh, during uh, Rich and Justin's great discussion Thursday on Airbnb and gathering limitations, he wanted to add his own two cents. So I'm just going to read this in, in, in his words now. I just moved and had a few weeks in D.C. in between. Hotels are super cheap, and I could have stayed at a four-star hotel for about $100 a night. I chose an Airbnb that was actually slightly more expensive for the following reasons. Number one, Airbnb. B owners aren't getting federal bailouts. So he's trying to help the little guy out here. Um, two, you know, I could cook. It reduces room service expenses and restaurant exposure. Three, I was, you know, I went out um, in the morning for a run and I wasn't in the same stairway or elevator as a hundred other guests um, and employees. And then four, I can do laundry, clean my own linens and towels, and I don't have some stranger in my room cleaning it frequently. I felt a lot safer. Um, and in Airbnb, I can understand why their value is weirdly increasing during a pandemic. I hope you all are safe. Uh, during the pandemic and heat wave and fires. And once again, that is from Mike in steamy Dubai. Yeah, that in, in a lot of ways, it's it kind of just highlights what makes a Airbnb appealing to begin with, but just like kind of more so in a lot of those points, like those those all sounded pre-pandemic, like, hey, you know, I can support a, you know, a local homeowner and, uh, you know, I can I can kind of have my own privacy and stuff like that. But yeah, definitely kind of puts a spotlight on it, uh, given everything that's going on for sure. Yeah. And I think I actually probably would, 
you know, opt for an Airbnb if it was feasible, um, you know, as well. I did have to stay in a hotel since we've been in the pandemic and I did not want anybody coming in and cleaning up the room. It's like, no, we'll, we'll be good until we leave. <laughs> um, you know, you know, the room is clean when we got there. We absolutely checked it out. We probably sprayed a quarter can of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, disinfectant spray, uh, you know, throughout the room, but I did not want anyone else coming into that room the whole time that myself and my family were there. So, you know, so we did not use uh, room service and I can see a lot of people opt for Airbnb, that would actually work for them as well. Well, some people we do run around are our master and grandmaster level patrons, and we want to give them a shout out, including Ali Sanjabi, Paul Thiessen, and John Atwood. Thank you so, so much uh, for supporting the show at that level. Truly, truly appreciated. Another person we appreciate, Len Peralta. He's here, he's drawing, he's making art, and he's joining us on a Friday, uh, as we would expect. Uh, Len, what do we got in store today? Well, you know, Rob said something during the discussion story that COVID has changed uh, the world forever. And that's uh, sort of my take on it. Uh, I love, first off, I love the virtual uh, uh, arenas. I think they're really, really cool. Uh, but also I feel that it's a little, you know, if I'm going to take this to another logical conclusion, uh, this is what I think a watch party might look like in the future. Hopefully not, but uh, <laughs> it's a little bit scary. Uh, it's, uh, this is called Watch Party COVID, uh, COVID Edition. Uh, you have a gentleman who is not only in a glass bubble, but also has a suit on, a, a diving bell sort of helmet on, uh, a mask. Uh, he is uh, six or more feet away from a television <laughs> or anything else, and uh, he is in a um, in a, uh, a padded cell. So uh, hopefully it doesn't get this bad. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, it's uh, it's it's still a very interesting take, and uh, hopefully watch parties. Uh, won't really resemble this in the future, but it is kind of fun to think about. So um, so this uh, image is actually available right now on my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len, or you can get it on my online store right at lenperaltastore.com. Oh, thank you, Len. Amazing, amazing stuff as always. And thanks, Rob Dunwood, for being here. Hey, it's my first time on a podcast with you, Rob. Uh, I had a blast. I uh, hope you did too. I absolutely did. And it's like, it's, you know, it's the first time we've actually talked, but I feel like I've been listening to you for years because I probably have. <laughs> so <laughs> I probably, I know, I know I've listened to, uh, you know, several of your shows, you know, on, on dozens of occasions. So it's a real good time, uh, you know, uh, you know, doing the show with you this week, this week, or I should say this day, this Friday. <laughs> And remember, you can always uh, support our show at any level at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Uh, remember, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back Monday. Have a super sparkly weekend, everybody. Take care. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>